going to be talking today about thinking event-driven architectures with serverless. Um, the reason why I want to talk about it is because in the last three years, I've been working on the development of an event-driven services platform for a large financial organization with ThoughtWorks. And most recently, um, I've been working with a global scale uh, retail company on their journey, uh, on their migration to the uh, public cloud. So my goal here today is to share with you a summary um, of the commonalities between those two concepts and also the most important benefits that I believe that you get, you can get when you bring together event-driven architectures and the serverless model. So I want to start with, with an example. So let's imagine an online restaurant where you have customers, they can choose items from a menu and they can place orders. So a very simple data model. That could be implemented like with three separate services. Let's say menu, uh, customers, and orders. Each one of those services, they have independent data sources, and they exchange information directly and synchronously. Because you want an event-driven architecture, now we don't want those services to communicate with each other directly anymore. Instead, we're going to have an infrastructure component, usually called an event bus, which is responsible for exchanging messages between the services. So the data flow in an application like that will go like this. So let's say that we have an API client um, who wants to send a, a change request to one of the services. So a uh, request will be made to one of the services. Business logic will execute. Eventually, if everything goes well, an event will be created. A response is sent back to the API client right away. Uh, either with success or failure. And the message will be published on the event bus so that the uh, consumers can be notified right away. So the advantages of having an architecture like that, uh, first of all, is the flexibility you get when you have lower coupling between the components. Now, the services don't need to be aware about each other anymore. They don't need to know uh, which address to send requests, how to digitalize response. The only thing they, they uh, need to know now is how to digitalize messages from the event bus. That also makes our uh, entire system more resilient because if one service goes down, the other services can still serve functionality because they are aware about the last global valid state. And also performance is another advantage because we usually don't have multiple requests going on to uh, fulfill a, a single client request. So now the services, uh, the protocol of communication between them are the events. So each service will have a list of events that they publish and a list of events that they consume. And let's take a look um, on the internal structure of each one of those services. So there are different flavors of event-driven architectures. The one I want to talk about here today uh, is the one based on command query responsibility segregation, SecureS, and event sourcing. So in a SecureS application, we're going to have on the top uh, one data model, which is the command model, and on the bottom, uh, the query model. The responsibility of the command model is uh, writing data, and the responsibility of the query model is reading data. On the command model, we're going to have um, an event store because we're using event sourcing so that we are not going to store the, only the current state of the application, but we are going to store a sequence of events so that we can rebuild the current state of the application in memory using an aggregate. So that gives us a lot of flexibility um, and a lot of different um, possibilities like analytics, audits, and even debugging the application becomes easier. So as you can observe, command and query, they do not communicate directly with each other, even though they are in the same service but they exchange message, uh, the, command, uh, the, command, sir, uh, the command side will send a, a message through the event bus so that the query side can have a listener and then update a denormalized version of the entities which is optimized for search. So that's usually the way it works in a secure S application. Uh, this is also interesting because, look, uh, we have separate data models so we can implement them in completely different ways using different technologies. And we also can scale them differently. In most applications, especially in financial applications, we have a lot more reads than writes. So it would make sense for us to scale the query side differently. So I want to discuss a little bit about the same concepts 
but now taking the perspective of uh, the serverless model. So when we first think about serverless, uh, we don't have servers anymore. Of course we do, but we just don't care about them anymore. With serverless, the idea is that we are going to eliminate configuration management and infrastructure provisioning so that we can focus directly on the application development. So um, I like the Mike uh, Roberts' definition of serverless. He's going to be speaking in more detail about that later. But a serverless can be described as the combination of two concepts, backend as a service, which are pretty much infrastructure components provided by a cloud provider, like Amazon S3, Google BigQuery, Amazon SNS, and function as a service, which are runtime environments provisioned and managed by the cloud providers. Examples are AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and OpenWhisk. I would like to point out a few factors which I believe are important when we were talking about serverless. Uh, first one is abstraction. When we work with VMs, we abstract the hardware. When we work with containers, we abstract the kernel. When we work with uh, uh, functions, we abstract the execution environment so that we can only focus on the application development and its logic. Another factor is deployment. Usually deployments are managed by the cloud provider so that we don't need to worry about downtimes or implementing strategies like blue-green deployment. Also, scalability usually comes for free. Um, once you're using those solutions, you get dynamic scalability. Uh, by default, you don't need to uh, set up your uh, auto scaling groups and launch configurations. And monitoring. In most, uh, in most function as a service offerings, you're going to have a way to uh, monitor and follow the logs and set up alerts around your functions so that you don't need to build the monitoring infrastructure around your cluster. Uh, and the last factor is the cost. Um, when you use functions, you're going to optimize the cost because you're going to be charged only for the execution time of your functions instead of being charged for the entire infrastructure. So let's go back to our example, the online restaurant. And let's think about it in a serverless way. So let's imagine that we are going to implement the same example using, let's say, AWS. Um, the important thing is that the bounded contexts or the services we have they're still going to be the same because the, uh, the domain do not change. The only thing that is changing now is the implementation. So we still have the contract between the services uh, model as the events. So the uh, services still publish and consume the same events. But now the internal structure of each service will be different. Uh, we're still going to rely on secure S and event sourcing, uh, but instead of having a single service, we're going to have a composition of functions and infrastructure components. So let's see in a simplified way how uh, the data flow would be uh, in, a, in our application in a serverless way. So everything starts with a, a change request coming through the API gateway. And that will be handled by a command uh, function. The responsibility of the command function is to rebuild the current state of the application by reading the events on the event store. The event store can be implemented as a DynamoDB, let's say. So business logic will be executed, validations, and then uh, the command function will write a new event to the event store. So DynamoDB will publish a cloud event that will trigger a, a, another function, which is the event publisher. This event publisher, the only responsibility of it is uh, to get the confirmation that the operation went successfully and that we have a new event on the event store. And now it's going to publish this event to the event bus which here can be implemented as a, a SNS, SNS topic. Next, the consumers of that particular event will be notified immediately, and some of them will be <coughs> updating uh, the query representation of the entities on the query database, which again is a denormalized version of the entities in our domain optimized for search. So the last function we can implement here would be a query function. Uh, which has a responsibility of reading data from the query database and serving it back to the API callers. Um, the, or, the original version of this presentation, I would uh, go through a live demo, but since you don't have time here, I'm just posting here the uh, uh, link to my GitHub where you can find the implementation of this particular example. 
Uh, we can talk about it later and I can show you the code if you want. So I would like to uh, finish now with some final thoughts. I was, uh, I think that uh, during this presentation I was able to point you out to, to the uh, benefits that, that I believe uh, are important uh, when, you, when you bring together EDAs and serverless. But there are still a few questions that I believe that everyone considering adopting a solution like that should uh, ask themselves. First one would be the cost of operations. I guess that if operations is, a, is something that is significantly high cost in your organization, going serverless can be a, a very good way to get started. On the other hand, vendor locking becomes a problem now. We don't have BigQuery on AWS and we don't have DynamoDB on Google Cloud Platform. So once you adopt a cloud provider, you get pretty much restricted to the offerings of that particular cloud provider. Customization is another problem, I would say. If you need a high level of customization in your infrastructure components for some business reason of your organization, um, adopting a backend as a service solution might be very tricky. Also, predictability is interesting. Considering, let's say, as an example, the uh, billing model of uh, AWS Lambdas and EC2, at some point when your load is pretty high and pretty predictable, maybe having a couple of a very robust EC2 instances becomes more financially cheap for you than relying on dynamic scalability and uh, execution time of lambdas. And finally, the nature of the problem is really important, especially when we are talking about an event-driven system. Does your problem domain fit uh, on, a, on an event-driven uh, architecture? Can you describe your problem domain with commands and events? If yes, like in the financial um, um, domain or in some other domains where you rely a lot on uh, keeping track of every uh, user interaction with your system, then you, it probably makes sense. But if your, if your system, if, you, if the application you're building uh, cannot be described with events, be careful because an event-driven architecture can be very expensive and usually it's very hard to, to go back. So that's all I got for today. Thank you for coming. Thank you.